Today, we move to the third chapter of Hornbill and that is Discovering Tut. The saga continues. Now, the image itself tells you that we are moving towards ancient Egypt. So, let's discover more about it as we know what A.R. Williams has in store for us. Let's talk about her. Anne R. Williams is a former senior writer for National Geographic magazine and online news where she covered the world and all that's in it for almost three decades. Williams received a BA in Classical and Near Eastern Archaeology from Brian Moore College and an MA in West Asian Archaeology with minors in Egyptology and Acadian cuneiform from the University of Toronto. Wow, that were many feathers to her cap, yeah? Lots she did. She and her husband lived in Silver Spring, Maryland and travel whenever they get the chance. So yeah, she is uh, interested a lot about, she's given us a lot about Egypt. So let's see what it has there for us. Now, moving on to the plot, the emperors of Egypt were known as pharaohs. They had a vast empire and enormous gold, a lot of gold. They believed in afterlife. Afterlife as in, they believe that there is life after death. So they had a very different culture. They had a very different ritual. You will know soon. So they mummified the dead body. We are all aware the mummy you watched. You, I'm sure you all have watched that movie. They actually, you know, cover it up that whole the dead body and they keep it in one tomb. So how they do it? Just watch. So they mummified the dead body of the king and they buried in a tomb. They put beside the dead a lot of treasure and even the things of everyday need. Why? These things were meant for use in the next life. Now they believe that if that person dies, they, they mummify it, right? They put it in the tomb and in that tomb, they put a lot of gold, money, a lot of things which you need every day. Why? Because they feel that person can use it in the next life. These tombs were built up to 26 feet below and the mummy was put in a gold case. Tut was the last of a ruling dynasty. Now he was the last of them. He died young, only nine years after occupying the throne. So he ruled basically only for nine years. His tomb was discovered after years of searching and investigated in 1922 by a British archaeologist, Howard Carter. He had trouble taking the mummy out of the coffin of solid gold. The resins had hardened. Now, resins are actually, it's basically, uh, it's a sticky, you know, substance. It's a, it's a flammable, insoluble in water substance. So probably to stick it round. So this, it had hardened. The body was cut and removed in parts. It was reassembled and put in a case at the resting place. But it was taken out again. So once it had happened, then again it was taken out for a CT scan in 2005 to solve the mystery of his death. They wanted to know how he had died so young. So again his body was literally taken out, right, for a CT scan. And the CT scan dispelled all the doubts. Nothing had gone seriously wrong. Tut is resting in peace in his tomb in the valley of the departed kings of Egypt. So there, there is a valley especially where all the kings of the Egypt are buried. So he is also there. He's resting in peace out there. So let's move on to see what the chapter has in store. He was just a teenager when he died. The last heir of a powerful family that had ruled Egypt and its empire for centuries. He was laid to rest, laden with gold and eventually forgotten. Now, uh, I see, I mean, you, you can see a lot of vocabulary out here, but to make it very simple for you, we have it right there at, at a glance. So if you look at the word, you read the meaning and then you connect easily. Yeah, so there are a lot of words not to worry. The solution is also there for you, right? So the last A, we know he's a successor, the next in line. 
okay, of a powerful family that had ruled Egypt and its empire for centuries. Now, he was laid to rest. That means he was buried. Laden means loaded. Lot of things. You remember they said lot of gold and eventually, finally, it was forgotten. Since the discovery of his tomb in 1922, the discovery, we know the act of uncovering and tomb is that large vault for burial. They have that large vault. You know, the Christians generally do that. They have that large vault for burial. So you can see that out frame there. Uh, so, since the discovery of his tomb in 1922, the modern world had speculated. Now, what they had speculated, they had formulated theories without firm evidence. They did not have proper proof that it had happened. So, they had just speculated about what happened to him with murder being the most extreme possibility. They said, now, as a king, he died so young as a teenager. Probably, mostly, it can be a murder. Now, leaving his tomb for the first time in almost 80 years, Tut has undergone a city scan that offers new clues about his life and death. City scan, we all know it is a computed tomography. Yeah, you get to see the organs of your body. In Here they use x-rays, right? And if you look at the difference between city scan and MRI, MRI they use radio waves. So that's the difference between these two. So here, yes, it offers new clues about his life and death and it provides precise data for an accurate forensic reconstruction of the boyish pharaoh. Now, let's look at what he's trying to say is, uh, he left his tomb for the first time in almost 80 years. So after 80 years, he has undergone a city scan which offers new clues about his life and death. And what does it provide? It provides precise data for an accurate process of recreating the face of an individual. Forensic reconstruction is you redo the face of that person of the boyish pharaoh. Pharaoh is the ruler. We said the emperors of the ancient Egypt. So this is what uh, Tut was going through. Now, an angry wind stirred up. Now they are telling you the process. So when he was being taken out from, you know, uh, uh, his tomb, what had happened, actually what it is, right? So an angry wind stirred up ghostly dust devils as King Tut was taken from his resting place in the ancient Egyptian cemetery known as the Valley of the Kings. Now, when they went to the Valley of the Kings, when they were trying to remove him, what had happened? First and foremost, there was an abnormal angry wind. Okay, that st stirred up. It was ghostly as in it was really unreal. It was not, it, it doesn't really happen. It was not a natural process. It was very unreal. Dust devils as in small whirlwind of sand. You can, you know, just visualize that story, that, that scene as part. As King Tut was taken from his resting place in the ancient Egyptian cemetery. We all know what's a cemetery. It's a large burial ground where they bury all the people which are dead. Known as the Valley of the Kings. Now there, like we said even before, there was a special valley and where all the kings were buried. So they, he was taken out from there. Dark bellied clouds had scudded across the desert sky all day and now were wailing the stars in casket gray. What do you mean? Dark bellied clouds as in they were dark colored. They were absolutely dark colored clouds all around that time. They had scudded across as in they were moving quickly. Now just see, you know, the whirlwind of the sand, the dark clouds moving quickly in the desert all day and now were wailing the stars in casket gray. Now, Stars were either light gray or, you know, light black or gray color. You had those stars wailing across. It was 6 p.m. on 5th January 2005. The world's most famous mummy, gilded head first into a city scanner, brought here to probe the lingering medical mysteries of this little understood young ruler who died more than 3,300 years ago. Now, it was in the year 2005 when this whole episode happened. Now, the world's most famous mummy, now this 
King Tut, uh, actually also known as Tutankhamen, if you know the entire name, he is known basically more, he's more famous as King Tut, right? But actually the whole name was Tutankhamen. So just to bring it to your notice, now, the most famous mummy, his, his was the most famous mummy, gilded head first as in, it was covered thinly with a layer of gold, right? First into a city scanner, brought here to probe as in to investigate the lingering which were the long lasting medical mysteries of this little ruler, this young ruler who died more than 3,300 years, 300 years ago. All afternoon, the usual line of tourists from around the world had descended into the cramped rock cut tomb some 26 feet underground to pay their respects. Now there was a huge line, there was a huge line to pay their respects, you know, to him. So they had descended as in they had uh, been there, they had moved into the cramped rock cut tomb. The tomb was rock cut, it was actually done through that which was 26 feet underground to pay their respects. They gazed at the murals on the walls. Murals are the paintings or carvings. You can see that all around the walls, you found these murals of the burial chamber and peered at Tut's gilded face. And they peered as in they looked at Tut's face, which, were, which had a nice thin layer of gold. The most striking feature of his mummy shaped outer coffin lid. Now what was the most striking feature out there of his mummy was the mummy shaped outer coffin lid. The lid was very different. The lid of his, you know, the coffin was very different. Some visitors read from guidebooks in a whisper. The guidebooks out there were books of information about a place or designed for the use of tourists. We all know we get those guidebooks when we travel, right? So they read from guidebooks in a whisper. Others stood silently, perhaps pondering Tut's untimely death in his late teens or wondering with a shiver if the Pharaoh's curse, death or misfortune falling upon those who disturbed him was really true. Now there was this one strange thing that had happened. Okay, so when they came there, all the tourists came there, some were reading the books, some were pondering, they were thinking deeply about the untimely, that it was not even expected, it was an unexpected or an early death in his late teens. He was just in his teens, right? Wondering with the shiver, now if the Pharaoh's curse, now there was a curse of, about this Pharaoh, death or misfortune, misfortune as in bad luck. Death or bad luck falling upon those who disturbed him, who would disturb him, either they would die or they would face bad luck was really true. Whether this curse which had come, uh, which everyone was aware of, they kept wondering was this curse really true or not. The mummy is in very bad condition because of what Carter did in the 1920s, said Zahi Havas. Secretary General of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities as he leaned over the body for a long first look. Now, the body had been literally dismantled. Okay, it was in a very bad shape. Why? Because of what Carter had done in 1920s. Right, the Secretary General of Egypt's Supreme of, uh, Council of Antiquities objects from the ancient past. Now, this is all to deal with the ancient Egypt, right? So all people dealing with those were actually, uh, you know, there. Now, as he leaned over the body for a first long look, he actually looked at the body for a very long time and that was the first time he actually saw it. Carter, Howard Carter, that is or rather that was the British archaeologist who in 1922 discovered Tut's tomb after years of futile searching. Now we know who are archaeologists, the people who study history, right? So he was the one who had discovered the tomb after years of pointless searching. There was no point, but he had actually found it after a lot many years. Its contents, though hastily, the, the contents means the things inside something, all the contents which were inside that, right? 
though hastily ransacked in antiquity, ransacked as in they raided, okay, in antiquity was surprisingly complete. They were over, they were complete. They remain the richest royal collection ever found and have become part of the pharaoh's legend. Now these things, they remain as the richest royal collection. You can imagine being the youngest emperor, of course, who died very young. He had so much of gold around him, right? Now this became a part of pharaoh's legend. Pharaoh's legend as in a traditional story or a myth probably. Stunning artifacts in gold. Artifacts are the item observed. All right, all the items observed there. They were of gold. They are eternal brilliance meant to. Eternal as in existing forever. Meant to guarantee resurrection. Now here, guarantee was full guarantee that, okay, what the way the things were kept for him, all the gold that was there, it guaranteed that it was bringing back to life. You know, there was a resurrection caused a sensation. It caused a feeling at the time of the discovery. Now, looking at all the gold around him, at all the material, all the artifacts that were there, they felt that looking at this, it was like proper guarantee that, you know, things were coming back to life. It was going to definitely go back to life and still get the most attention, okay? It, it laid a sensation at the time of discovery and still get the most attention. But Tut was also buried with everyday things he'd want in the afterlife. You remember we said it right in the beginning, they believed in life after death. Board games, a bronze razor, linen undergarments, cases of food and wine. So things which he needed every day, his everyday need, all these things were also there. The things which he needed for life after death. After months of carefully recording the Pharaoh's funerary treasures, they started, you know, taking into account all what was there. Funerary treasures as in relating to a funeral. Carter began investigating his three nested coffins. Now, Carter in 1920s when he had started, so he started investigating his three nested coffins. Opening the first, he found a shroud adorned with garlands of willow and olive leaves, wild celery, lotus petals and corn flowers, the faded evidence of a burial in March or April. Now, there it was this season of March or April where you would get these corn flowers or you would get the uh, wild celery. All these were available in March or April. So that's where they concluded that it was done then, right? Because they found that evidence. He found a shroud, a dawn. A shroud is a cloth wrapping a dead person. They had uh, wrapped him, obviously. Adorned with, as in he was decorated. Generally, we know whenever people die, that's how even in our Hindu culture, you know, we cover the dead body with a cloth and then we put flowers and garlands, right? Now, which were the, uh, what made you say that it is March or April? Why? Because there was the presence of garlands of willow and olive leaves, wild celery, lotus petals and corn flowers. Now, this was pure evidence. It was proof of a burial in March or April. So yeah, you need to keep this in mind. When he finally reached the mummy, that was the dead body, though he ran into trouble. Now, when he finally reached the mummy after, you know, the layers of uh, coffins he opened, he got into trouble. The ritual resins had hardened. The ritual resins as in the sticky flammable substance. Right Now that had hardened, it had become very hard. That substance, that sticky substance had actually become too hard. Cementing tut to the bottom of his solid gold coffin. The whole coffin was made of gold, right? Don't forget, he was the emperor. Cementing as in he was bound together, he was stuck. So basically the resin played like the, you know, the role of a glue, of glue actually, the gum, right? So keeping him stiff in the gold coffin. No amount of legitimate force could move them, Cart wrote, Carter wrote later. Now he said nothing, however, I mean, you know, reasonable force I could apply. However, we tried to pull it out, it could not move. That's what he wrote later. 
what was to be done. Now, if that was the case, the body was not ready to come out of that coffin. It was so glued to the coffin because he wanted to try removing it. He couldn't. So, the question was, what was to be done? The sun can beat down like a hammer this far south in Egypt and Carter tried to use it to loosen the resins. Now, to a good extent, he kept the body in the sun. He kept that coffin rather. So that probably that substance, the resins which had hardened would probably melt or soften so that they could pull him out, right? So the sun can beat down like a hammer, okay? This far south in Egypt and Carter tried to use it to loosen the resins for several hours. He set the mummy outside in blazing sunshine, blazing as in very hot. You know, Egypt, it's a desert, so you can imagine the heat out there, right? The degrees are so, so high. That heated it to 149 degrees Fahrenheit, but nothing moved, nothing budged at all. There was no slight movement that resin did not loosen for the body to move out. He reported with scientific detachment that the consolidated material had to be chiseled away from beneath the limbs and trunk before it was possible to raise the king's remains. He says, now, this is not working. He tried the sun, he tried the heat, the excessive heat, but still nothing worked out. So now what was his next thing was, he reported with scientific detachment, detachment as in the state of being aloof, that the consolidated material, the combined material, all that the glue and the material around had to be chiseled away. You can see the chisel out there. It had to be cut with a chisel from beneath the limbs. The limbs were the arms and the legs and the trunk. The trunk was the body part before it was possible to raise the king's remains. He said, now we will have to chisel it. We'll have to cut it with a chisel to actually free him from that coffin. In his defense, Carter really had little choice. He actually did not have much choice to save himself. He had no other go. If he hadn't cut the mummy free, thieves most certainly would have circumvented the guards and ripped it apart to remove the gold. Now, he says if he wouldn't have done that, if he wouldn't take, have taken that step to actually remove it from there, what would have happened is the thieves most certainly would have found a way around. They would have done something around the guards and ripped it apart to remove the gold. They would have done anything to get the gold from there. In Tut's time, the royals were fabulously wealthy. They were extremely wealthy, wonderfully wealthy, and they thought or hoped they could take their riches with them. Now, they were in that belief that, you know, all that we earn here, all the, all the gold that we have here, we will take with us when we die. But as per our Hindu culture, we cannot even take a paisa, not one single paisa. We go empty hand, don't we? But for them, it was a different culture. They felt they could take the riches, all the gold or the money with them. For his journey to the great beyond, for his journey to the great beyond as in afterlife, King Tut was lavished with glittering goods. He was lavished as in he was given large amount of shining goods. Shining were all his coins, his riches, precious collars, inlaid necklaces, that is embedded necklaces. You know, they used to wear those big uh, chunk, that necklace type, and bracelets, rings, amulets, and a ceremonial apron. Ceremonial as in it related to ceremonies. Being the kings, they used to attend those ceremonies. Sandals and sheets for his fingers and toes. Sheets as in close fitting covers for his fingers and toes and the now iconic inner coffin and mask all of pure gold. Iconic as in symbolic. Yeah, that whole thing made of gold. Inner coffin and mask all of pure gold. You can just imagine taking this into consideration how much gold would have been there. You can just imagine Calculate all this. To separate Tut from his adornments, from his ornaments, Carter's men removed the mummy's head. 
they had to separate the head and severed nearly every major joint and they cut every major joint of his body because that's how they could remove him. Once they had finished, they reassembled the remains. They were through with it. Then what they did was they put them together again, all the remains on a layer of sand in a wooden box with padding that concealed the damage. The bed where Tut now rests. They removed all the gold. They removed everything from there. And what they did was after they reassembled, they put the body back together again. They laid it on a layer of sand, now which was all gold, gold, gold everywhere. Now it was just a layer of sand in a wooden box, not in the gold coffin, in a wooden box with padding that concealed the damage. With padding as in he was covered in such a manner that the damage that was done to his body, his major joints were cut, all of them were hidden. The bed where Tut now rests. Now he is resting there. Archaeology has changed substantially in the intervening decades. Now, it archaeology, of course, the study of history has changed a lot. By now, it has changed a lot in the intervening decades as the in-between decades now that you talk of and then now in between that period, it has changed a lot. Focusing less on treasure and more on the fascinating details of life and intriguing mysteries of death. Initially, it was all about gold. It was all about treasure, right? Now the focus had moved. Now what had it become? It had become more fascinating. What? On the fascinating details of life and the intriguing as in arousing one's curiosity. You're curious to know about what? The mysteries of death, how it happened, what happened, all that. It also uses more sophisticated tools as in more developed tools. Obviously, it was not like that that he had to use the chisel and cut the body. None of that sort. Including medical technology. We all know the development. In 1968, more than 40 years after Carter's discovery, an anatomy professor, anatomy is the person who studies the science of human body, right? An anatomy professor x-rayed the mummy and revealed a startling fact. Now, there was another person, another professor who studies, you know, the science of human body. He gave another uh, startling fact as in a very surprising, a very shocking fact. And what was that? Beneath the resin, beneath the resin as in beneath that, you know, that substance we spoke about, that flammable substance that cakes his chest, that's on his chest, it's covering his chest his breastbone and the front ribs are missing. Oh my God. Now, there was another shocking fact that his breastbone and his front ribs were missing. Now, this is what this professor discovered. Today, diagnostic imaging, diagnostic imaging as in the use of electromagnetic radiation to produce images of internal structures of the body. You know, you have this diagnostic imaging can be done with computed tomography or CT that we already spoke of by which hundreds of x-rays in cross section are put together like slices of bread to create a three dimensional virtual body. Virtual body as in it is made by software. It is not physical like you know, we are doing virtually right? So this is the same. It created virtual images of the organs inside the body. What more would a CT scan reveal of Tut than the X-ray? What more could there be? And could it answer two of the biggest questions still lingering about him? Now, was this good enough to answer these two questions? What were the two questions? How did he die? And how old was he at the time of his death? They still feel that these two questions, the, actually the whole thing began with these two questions. They wanted to find out. But right now they feel even after all this, are these two questions answered? Were they successful at finding out? King Tut's demise, his death was a big event. Because why? It was an untimely death. It was very early. Even by the royal standards. He was the last of his family's line 
and his funeral was the death rattle of a dynasty. He was the last one and that's where it ended. But the particulars of his passing away and its aftermath are unclear. It is not yet clear what actually had happened. Amenhotep III, Tut's father or grandfather, was a powerful pharaoh who ruled for almost four decades at the height of the 18th dynasty's golden age. His son, Amenhotep IV, succeeded him. So after him, it was Amenhotep IV who succeeded him and he initiated, he started one of the strangest periods in the history of ancient Egypt. And what was that initiative he took? What did he start? The new pharaoh promoted the worship of the Aten, the sun disk. He changed his name to Akhenaten or servant of the Aten and moved to the religious capital from the old city of Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, known now as Amarna. Now, this is what he initiated. What he did was he promoted the worship of the art. And you can see the sun disk. He started worshipping. He started getting into that. And he changed his name to Akhenaten. What was his name actually? His name was Amenhotep. But he changed his name to Akhenaten or the servant of the Aten. And what all he did was he moved the religious capital, the religious capital from the old city of Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, now known as Amarna. So these are the changes he brought about. That was the new thing he had initiated. He further shocked the country. He did not stop at that. He went on to do something more. He further shocked the country by attacking Amun, a major god, smashing his images and closing his temples. He went on still to do a little more, a little lot of his bravery. It must have been a horrific time, said Ray Johnson, the director of the University of Chicago's research center in Luxor, the site of ancient Thebes. Now, he said this must have been something really terrible. The family that had ruled for centuries was coming to an end. And then Akhenaten went a little wacky. He went more crazy. After Akhenaten's death, a mysterious ruler named Sminker appeared briefly and exited with hardly a trace. So after Akhenaten, the next heir was Sminker. He was there for, he ruled for a very short time and he exited with hardly a trace. He just disappeared. And then a very young Tutankhaten took the throne. King Tut as he is widely known today. That's how he is known today. The boy king soon changed his name to Tutankhamun, living image of Amun and oversaw a restoration of the old ways. He started returning something to the former condition. The way they were before, he started trying to bring that. He reigned, he ruled for about nine years and then he died unexpectedly. Very unexpectedly, within nine years of his ruling, he died. Regardless of his fame and speculations about his faith, Tut is one mummy among many in Egypt. He's one of those mummies. How many? No one knows. How many mummies? How do you know how many have been buried there? The Egyptian mummy project, which began an inventory in late 2003. Inventory as in making a list of contents. Like, you know, they started making a list of it. And they have recorded almost 600 so far and is still counting. So it is still in process. Maybe by now there must have been many more. The next phase, the next period, scanning the mummies with a portable city machine donated by the National Geographic Society and Siemens, its manufacturer. Now the next part was you had the city scanning. So you had that machine donated by the National Geographic Society and Siemens, its manufacturer. King Tut is one of the first mummies to be scanned. In death 
as in life, moving regally ahead of his countrymen. Regally as in resembling a monarch. He was an emperor, remember? So yeah, he was the first of the mummies to be scanned, to be sent through that city scan machine. A city scan machine scanned the mummy head to toe, creating 1,700 digital x-ray images in cross section. Now, he was the first one to be city scanned, right? Tut's head scanned in 0.62 millimeter slices to register its intricate structures. Intricate structures as in very complicated structures. Takes, and takes on airy detail in the resulting image. It's a very strange detail in the resulting image. With Tut's entire body similarly recorded, a team of specialists in radiology, forensics and anatomy began to probe, they began to investigate the secrets that the winged goddesses of a gilded burial shrine protected for so long. Now, what happened was the whole body was similarly recorded just like the face was done where it showed you some 0.62 millimeter slices. Then what happened is a team of specialists and which specialists? Radiology, forensics and anatomy. All these, they came together to investigate the secret that the winged goddesses of a gilded burial shrine, shrine as in a casket containing sacred relics, uh, of course, after the dead. So, you know, it's all considered very sacred, very holy, protected for so long, where he was protected for so long, you know, with all the, by the winged goddesses. Now they had tried to investigate into those secrets. The night of the scan, workmen carried Tut from the tomb in his box. Now they are telling you how it actually happened and what was the outcome. Like pal bearers, pal bearers as a person helping to carry or officially escorting a coffin at a funeral, they climbed a ramp, they climbed a sloping surface joining two different levels and a flight of stairs into the swirling sand outside then rose on a hydraulic lift. Hydraulic is relating to a liquid moving in a confined space under pressure. Uh, lift into the trailer that held the scanner. Now they moved the body into that, the mummy into that. 20 minutes later, two men emerged. They sprinted for an office nearby and they returned with a pair of white plastic fans. The million dollar scanner had quit because of sand in a cooler fan. Now you remember he was buried in sand. So when they brought him there, there were specks of sand around and that uh, those got stuck into the fans. Curse of Pharaoh joked a guard nervously. You remember there was a curse that whoever disturbs the peace, whoever disturbs the peacefully lying Tut, King Tut, would definitely either face death or bad luck. So the guard over here is joking. That fan stopped, you know, the city scanner stopped. So the guard is actually sort of nervously, you know, cracking a joke saying that, curse of the pharaoh now this is the curse which is working on us we are the ones who have disturbed his sleep so we are going to face bad luck eventually finally the substitute fans worked well enough to finish the procedure they managed it somehow after checking that no data had been lost the technicians turned tut over to the workmen. The technicians who were doing all that, the experts in the practical application of a science who were doing uh, the scanning, they turned the tut, they turned tut over to the workmen, the men employed to do the manual labor, who carried him back to his tomb. Less than three hours after he was removed from his coffin, the pharaoh again rested in peace where the funerary Priest, the funerary priest, as in the people who perform religious ceremonies, the priest had laid him so long ago. Now, the priest had put him there. They had buried him with all the rituals and all the chantings. They had put him there. Now, these men put him back in that same place where he was buried years ago. Back in the trailer, a technician pulled up astonishing images of Tut 
on a computer screen. Now going back to where the thing had the scanning had been done, he pulled up an astonishing image. Astonishing means a very surprising image of Tut on a computer screen. A grey head took shape from a scattering of pixels. Pixels are the minute area of illumination on a display screen. You know you have pictures with different pixels, right? So from a scattering of pixels and the technician spun and tilted it in every direction. He tried to look at it from every direction. The neck vertebrae appeared as clearly as in an anatomy class. He could actually see the neck vertebrae. Other images revealed a hand, several views of the rib cage, and a transection of the skull. Transection as in a cross section along an axis. So they could see that of the skull as well. But for now, the pressure was off. They saw these really astonishing images, but right now the pressure was off. Sitting back in his chair, Zahi Havas smiled, visibly relieved that nothing had done seriously wrong. There was nothing which had really gone wrong over there. I didn't sleep last night, not for a second, he said. I was so worried, but now I think I will go and sleep. So now finally, after the scanning has happened, they have seen the images, that pressure has gone off his head. He couldn't sleep last night, but he says, right now I can go and relax. I can go and sleep. By the time we left the trailer, descending metal stairs to the sandy ground, the wind had stopped. You know, when they're taking the tomb out, there was an abnormal wind blowing. So he said, by the time we left the trailer, descending the metal stairs to the sandy ground, the wind had stopped. The winter air lay cold and still like death itself in this valley of the departed. All the departed souls, all the dead souls, they were all there, all the dead bodies. So he says, now it was all cool, it was chill. Why? Because it was the winter air. Just above the entrance to Tut's tomb stood Orion, the constellation that the ancient Egyptians knew as the soul of Osiris, the god of the afterlife, watching over the boy king. Now when they went to place the tomb back to where it was in the valley of the departed, you remember where all the kings had been buried, finally they took him there, they wanted to put him there and then they realized when they look on top, they saw the constellation, the Orion constellation that the ancient Egyptians believed they took it as the soul of the Osiris, the god of the afterlife. And they realized that this god is there right over the boy king. Boy king because he died as a teenager, right? They, he was there right over his tomb, right on top of his tomb, taking care of him and letting him rest in peace forever. Yes, that brings us to the end of this wonderful journey of ancient Egypt. It was very beautiful. We got to know so much, which probably we were not aware of. And so to conclude this chapter, we have a very beautiful quote for you. To excavate, excavate as in when you bury, you know, in the ground for dead remains, for all the remains. So what is to excavate? To excavate is to open a book written in the language that the centuries have spoken into the earth. Now, when you bury, you find all the dead remains of centuries ago, of all the ancient places, right? Like for example, here we found of ancient Egypt. So when you, when you find out, when you bury, you, it's literally everything is done in, mentioned in that language which was spoken centuries ago and now you find that buried into the earth. Well, we have many more stories lined up like this, but please remember, you need to read through your book once again. Of course, we have gone line by line, word by word, explaining to you every meaning of the word. But yes, once again, if you go, you know, you read through the chapter, you will actually master the chapter and you will be writing fantastic answers for your extracts, for your brief and your answers in detail. So yes, for the same, keep watching and keep learning.